Thank you very much. I'm going to stay down here in, in between the goalposts, uh, as I've been instructed to do, uh, so I can actually uh, go along with the slides. So it's my pleasure to be here and a little bit of a mix up for accents for you. So probably gathered I'm uh, from way south, well, way south Texas, uh, Australia originally. And I'm going to be talking today about genome editing and how I think this really um, intersects with the field of reproduction. And so if you're at the previous session, it spoke about the importance of genetics and really there's a real synergy between genetics and reproductive technologies and genome editing and that's why I think it's of particular interest to this particular community. And so I think we can all agree that we can make dramatic changes to our animal populations based on selection for appearance that meets our uh, desired specifications and you may or may not think that's an improvement on their ancestors or roof but some animal breeder thought this was an improvement and selected the breeds according to their preferences. And similarly, we have done such things in cattle. Um, and I think Dare Bullock and Matt Spangler spoke about how in the early 50s, we had little short ones that maybe weren't economically optimum. And in the 80s, we had really ginormous tall ones. And I felt a little bit sorry for the breeders in those days, because you can't even see them in their pictures getting their prizes at the, at the shows. And then actually, I think we had a little bit of think about that, or either of those economically optimum. And actually, probably somewhere in the middle, was a better, uh, more economically optimum animal. And what I think is interesting is this tells a story and one that we perhaps don't tell too often around the importance of genetics in sustainability. And what I'm showing on this slide here is the number of cattle shown in blue, starting off at around 100 million back here, rising up in the 70s. And tracking alongside against the right axis here is beef production. So we see an increase in cattle numbers to 130 million. We see an increase in beef production. But then something happens. We go down in cattle numbers such that today we're at approximately the same uh, number of cattle that we had back in the early um, 60s, so about 100 million. But the amount of beef we produced has about doubled. And something interesting happens here where we're having decreasing cattle numbers and increasing beef production. How do you do that? There's only one way you do that, and that is more beef per animal. And that is part of a sustainability story that I think we don't tell enough of because genetics is a way to get more from the same amount of resources or using less resources to produce the same amount of product. And we have a similar story as it relates to a lot of different animal protein sources and something that I think we don't celebrate enough. So how do breeders make those changes? Well, they are acting on the appearance of an animal and objective phenotypic measurements of their characteristics, but all of that, behind all of that, is genetics. Um, and of course, those of you hopefully in the room are familiar with the double helix and the fact that DNA makes RNA makes protein, and protein is what makes an animal grow fast or have feed efficiency or be disease resistant. That's the end product of selection. And we know that this double helix is made up of A's and T's and C's and G's. And it's the variation amongst those A's and T's and C's and G's that provides us with the naturally occurring genetic variation to select upon to produce an animal that is superior. And it's interesting to look at the fact that cattle and human genomes are around about 83% identical. So if you want to think about it, you're about kind of a genetically engineered cow in some ways. There's only 17% that differs between our species. And more generally, if we look across all of the different cattle breeds of the world, the difference in the genetics between these different breeds, the ones that are well suited to different environments, whether it be tropically adapted, whether they're producing milk or meat, whether they are tick resistant, is due to that 85 million genomic alterations that differ between the different breeds of cattle. And those are naturally occurring genomic alterations that have occurred through nature. It is actually the basis of evolution. It's the basis of all our breeding programs, and it's the basis of the variation that allows us to continue to make genetic gain every single generation. And if we look between different breeds, we can see those 
86.5 million genomic alterations. Those are single nucleotide polymorphisms, A switch to a G or a T to a C, or small insertions or deletions, little, little deletions, little insertions. That's what gives us that. And typically when you have a mutation, it doesn't affect the appearance of the animal. But there are some times when you have a gene that actually has a really big impact on a on a trait that we care about, such as meat yield. And I'll give you a classic example, and that is the example of myostatin in the Belgian blue breed. And so that animal there has had a mutation in the myostatin gene that's resulted in an inactivation of that gene. And both alleles of that gene have been knocked out in that case. And myostatin, if you know your Latin, myo is muscle and statin is stop. So if you knock out muscle stop, it's just you get muscle go. Um, and that's great. You get much more muscle yield, but it comes with a little drawback. And that is it's really hard to deliver those calves because they're such muscly little guys that they have trouble getting out the birth canal. And I'm going to digress a minute here and look at the genetic diversity that exists here. And because we're in Texas, I thought I might bring up a little bit of personal history here. So you may or might not know that in my past life, I was a bull rider. And there's my proof. Right there, I am sitting on a Santa Gertrudis bull, whose name, I believe, is Big Daddy. Am I right? Um, and so I stayed on for, is it nine seconds you have to stay on for? Eight. And could have stayed on for nine hours. He was gentle as a... As a um, as a <laughs> general as a, as a moose. Um, and so basically, I actually was an intern here on a, um, uh, an embryo transfer facility that did semen and embryo collection on Santa Gertrudis uh, cattle back in the early 80s. Um, and actually, as it happens, my host parents are here today to be uh, part of the, the presentation. And so I just want to uh, give a nod to the fact that for 40 years ago, that was my introduction to embryo transfer, um, and actually the United States also, and really started my love of uh, all things to do with assisted reproductive technologies and genetics in cattle. Um, and so it's a pleasure to have my host family here. We've had a 40 year acquaintance and um, we've been all over the world together, including uh, attending the Melbourne Cup Festival. Uh, and we can see all the fancy hats there, which is a very famous horse race in Australia, kind of the equivalent of the Kentucky. Derby. So with that background, I will continue with the fact that the uh, genetic improvements are a powerful tool to drive animal egg sustainability. And I think we've already seen the breeders equation today, and that is how do you drive or increase the rate of genetic gain shown here um, as delta G. And basically there are the four components of the breeders equation. You can more intensely utilize the best animals, and that's where assisted reproductive technologies comes in, artificial insemination and embryo transfer. You can more accurately identify the best animals, and that's where genomic selection comes in. You can increase the amount of additive genetic variation. Is it not working? Oh, okay. Sorry. Let's see if this is any better. Okay, how's that? Better? Okay, all right. Um, so we can uh, increase the accuracy using things like um, uh, genomic uh, selection, and we can increase the amount of additive genetic variation we have available. And that is really where genomic genome editing comes in, and I'll kind of uh, discuss that. And then, of course, we can decrease the generation interval. And that really is where a lot of the improvement for genomic selection has come, because we're now able to better select and identify genetically superior young males prior to having to go through um, a progeny testing program as we did in the past. And to kind of underline Matt and Dare's point from earlier on today, all of that has to be based on a structured breeding program with a clear breeding objective. So if you're speeding up your rate of genetic gain, you better be heading in the right direction. And that's really where the breeding objective comes in. So let's have a look at this thing, um, how it all comes together. So genetic improvement, we can use genomic selection, and that can uh, 
enable us to increase our accuracy, decrease our generation interval, on diff and particularly characterize difficult to measure traits like feed efficiency. Assisted reproductive technologies, your guys' focus is an uh, ability to increase intensity and also decrease generation interval. But it's really the synergy of those two technologies together is where you get added gains because you can use uh, basically assisted reproductive technology to, for example, do over pickup from your very young animals that enables you to start using that better genetics earlier and that can decrease your generation interval. And then finally, we bring this third in the trifecta here, and that's genome editing. And where does it play in? Well, it enables you potentially to inactivate genes that you don't want expressed in your animal, so it won't produce a protein that does something that you don't want it to do. It enables you potentially to knock in alleles from different breeds. So maybe you want to bring an allele from dairy cattle into beef cattle genetics or vice versa, or one breed color into another. Maybe you want to do an intraspecies allele introgression. And there we can do things, moving things um, such as between breeds in the absence of undesired linkage drag. And it's all of those together is what is really the synergistic opportunity that I think that exists between this community, the genome editing community, and the breeding community, which often don't sit in the same room together. It's quite interesting to me how distinct our scientific bubbles are, given our shared interests in trying to accelerate the rate of genetic gain. So what is genome editing? And I'm going to simplistically, hopefully, explain it to everybody here. It's a range of tools with very fancy sounding names like zinc finger nucleases, talons, and the ever famous CRISPR-Cas9 that all do much the same thing. And that is they introduce a targeted double-stranded break in the DNA double helix at a programmed location amongst the 3 billion base pairs that make up the bovine genome. So what I can do as a molecular geneticist is say, I want to introduce a double-stranded break in chromosome 17 at the 6,739th location. And I can do that by basically targeting these nucleases to cut at that location. Okay, great. You just broke the chromosome in half. How did that help? Well, it depends what happens next as to what the outcome of that double-stranded break is. So we have repair enzymes in our uh, DNA, in our cells to repair double-stranded breaks. It's actually part of our normal um, recombination process that happens during meiosis. But basically the cell says, uh-oh, I got a double-stranded break, I need to stick it back together. And so there's a couple of outcomes, and I'm going to refer to this outcome as the left-hand pathway. And basically, it can stick those ends back together, but if it makes an error and it drops a single base pair such that it throws the reading frame of the uh, RNA going to protein out of frame, you'll inactivate a gene. That's called a targeted knockout. And that's what's shown here. So this left-hand pathway, we're not introducing any DNA from outside the animal, we're just turning off a gene. Well, why would we want to turn off a gene? Well, maybe it does something that makes an animal susceptible to disease, and I don't want that protein expressed, I want it turned off. That's where you might do something like that. The right-hand pathway here, and I'm being very specific about making a distinction between these two pathways because it has huge regulatory implications as to which pathway is used to repair, and that basically the right-hand pathway here you're providing the cell with what's called a donor template or DNA sequence that you want it to use to repair that double-stranded break. And when it does that using this homology-directed repair map pathway, you'll get that light blue DNA incorporated there. And that light blue DNA may be a single base pair change a to a T, which maybe alters which amino acid gets incorporated into the protein, which gives it a function you want. That blue might be an allele from one breed that you've brought in, maybe the slick allele. No, actually, that's not a good example. The polled allele from uh, beef cattle being brought into dairy cattle genetics, or it technically could be DNA from a different species. In that case, it will be a transgenic organism or a GMO, to use the vernacular of uh, the, the, the public. Um, and what I mean by that is that the template will determine 
what the repair is. And depending what that template is, will de depend what the outcome is. So that was all explained to you with an Australian accent. I'm gonna let you hear it now with an American accent. And it's always good to reinforce these points. And I'm about to play a video, which I believe means I have to tell you, you people are about to play a video and we're gonna go for it. For centuries, several breeders have selected individuals to play in desirable qualities and prep them to produce particular colors. Breeders are actually selecting by naturally occurring DNA sequence variations that result in difference between individuals. Let me cover the past colors. Using the conventional breeding programs, achieving their time changes to make them. They say a picture's worth a thousand words, so I figure a video is worth several thousand words, but uh, repetition is good in extension. Is that right, Joe? Uh, so, okay, we can do genome editing. Well, how the heck do you edit a cow? Um, and so, yeah, so some people are asking that, and it's always fun. They say design your presentations as if your parents are in the room listening to it. Today, I actually had the opportunity to do that. So I've got to exchange how you go about editing a cow. Basically, you need to get to that genome um, and you need to get to that genome and those changes need to be passed on to the next generation. We want to do germline editing. That's a big no-no in human but it's actually the only thing that matters as it relates to editing in livestock. And so there are a couple of different ways that you can do this, um, but basically the end game is you want to produce this animal, which is a homozygous, non-mosaic animal that's edited at both the paternal and maternal allele at the gene you're trying to edit. And so homozygous, you're familiar with that term, the same um, allele from in mum and dad's chromosomes. Non-mosaic, I'm going to go into in a little detail because mosaicism is an expression for when there's more than one genotype present in an animal. And that's a problem because animals won't breed true if they're mosaic. And it is one of the problems associated with one approach to editing animals. And basically, I'm going to go into some detail here because this audience is reproductive. Uh, uh, people, and you are going to understand this in a way that perhaps the general public might not. So I'm going to start first with one approach, which is cloning an edited cell. And so this is Dolly style cloning, which probably familiar to most of you in this audience. And what we want to do here is we want to take a somatic cell from an elite animal, maybe an animal that already exists. So we know he's an amazing bull and he's 
great in every way, except we'd like him to also have one additional gene edited trait. We want to take the horns off him or we want to give him a heat adapted trait. So we're going to do the editing in this somatic cell and we're going to introduce our Cas9 and our, um, our template and make the changes. And we're going to sequence that cell line and make sure that we've got a homozygous, non-mosaic edited cell line. And then we're going to go and get oocytes from any old cow, maybe the slaughterhouse, we don't care because we're going to mature that oocyte and remove the nucleus from that oocyte. And then we're going to put the diploid edited cell line from the somatic cell into the enucleated oocyte, activate it, start embryonic development, put it into a surrogate cow, and nine months later, there's our magic beastie. That is the homozygous non-mosaic calf. The disadvantages of cloning, hello? Yes, not talking to me anymore. Uh, can we have the next slide? Oh, oops, now I need to go back. Okay, the disadvantages of cloning are that uh, the efficiencies are low, and so often you'll have a lot of congenital abnormalities, large offspring syndrome. Um, any of you that have cloned will know what I'm talking about. You're somewhat constrained to use an existing cell line, which maybe is already a mature animal. And you know that I said it's good to have a low generation interval. You'd like to be editing the next generation, not the last generation. And not all cell lines clone well. The advantages is you for sure get germline transmission because every single cell in that edited animal came from that one cell. And so they're gonna be the same. You can confirm the genotype, homozygous mosaic or non-mosaic if, that, if that's what you want. And you can get knock-ins, that is the right-hand pathway where you've got the template DNA. That works quite well in, in, uh, in cell lines because they're replicating. It doesn't work so well in the next approach I will describe, which is basically edit, editing the developing embryo. So what happens there? Now here, the thing that differs is we now care about our donor because half of the genetics of the embryo is going to be coming from her. And so we're going to be doing maybe ovum pickup um, from this animal or traditional uh, um, traditional flushing. We'll take that oocyte and we'll do in vitro fertilization with semen from the very best bull of our breed, if that's what we're after. And then at the six hours after fertilization, we're going to introduce the editing reagents into that developing one cell zygote. So the developing embryo, and then the editing hopefully is going to occur before that first cell division occurs and before DNA synthesis starts. Because I would like both paternal and maternal alleles edited before it starts replicating and becoming a multicellular embryo, because then it will be non-mosaic. And so then, of course, you have to still transfer to a surrogate cow, and nine months later, you'll get a calf. And if you're really, 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 really lucky, you'll get the homozygous non-mosaic, and you're done. You didn't have any of the problems associated with cloning, and you've edited the next generation. More likely, you might get a heterozygous non-mosaic, one allele, maybe dad's, got edited, the one, other one didn't. But what actually happens more commonly is that you will get a mosaic. Um, and that means that you've got different genotypes. And depending whether that genotype went into the germline or not will depend as to what gets passed on to the next generation. And typically when you get mosaics, you have to actually breed them through to get heterozygous and then cross the heterozygotes together to get 25% edited homozygotes. And that's a lengthy procedure in livestock like cattle that have a long generation interval, not to mention rather expensive. And so those are the different approaches and the advantages of microinjection in this developing zygote is you don't have any of the cloning artifacts. You can have a diversity of germplasm. You're editing that next generation. And you can get pretty good levels of knockouts, the left-hand pathway. What's not good is mosaicism. You get a low number of uh, edited versus live born, because some of them won't be edited at all. You have really no say unless you do some sort of an embryo biopsy. And then knock-ins, the, the left, the right-hand pathway is less efficient using this approach. So most of the editing to date has been done using cloning. More and more, you're starting to see editing using um, microinjection, and that has different implications for the outcomes as it relates to regulatory and more generally to breeding uh, in general. 
So let me just talk about mosaicism, and that is cells within an animal have more than one genotype. And so I've given you an example here where the animal was AA to start with, and I knocked in a, a gene that re results in a blue color, um, and that is BB. Um, and you'll see that this animal is mosaic, but we got really lucky in that he has blue balls, um, and consequently he's going to pass on his blue um, genotype. I did not actually intend that to be funny until I gave the talk last Saturday and then I'm like, oh, I hadn't thought of it that way, but <laughs> clearly my audience knew what, the, what I was talking about. So your outcomes are not edited, monoallelic or heterozygous edit, AB, or a homozygous edit. That would be the simplistic way to think about it. But if you're editing in a zygote, you can get other combinations. You can maybe get an edit that you weren't planning to get, a little bit different to B, you might get B and C, or you might get this mosaic. And the problem with that mosaic is you need to know what's going to come out in the germ line because that's what we care about as animal breeders. And it's commonly dealt with in mice studies by just breeding them through to the next generation. Well, that's easy in mice. That's what, three weeks or something. You know, two years in cattle or two, three, it's, that's going to be problematic, especially because I'm going to tell you shortly, is that all of these animals are new animal drugs, which uh, really complicates the situation. So how might I run this through a traditional breeding program using, this is an example, using cloning. And this is really based off um, a paper that was put out by Transover. And I've just added the editing step in here at the end. So take my good bull and my good cow, and I produce a whole bunch of embryos. Those are flush mates for want of a better expression. Put it into a cow to uh, mature for a couple of weeks until we can pull out the fetuses of all of these embryos. And then I'm gonna produce fibroblast cell lines from each of those embryos. I'm then gonna take the DNA and genotype those uh, different embryos and pick the best male and the best female based on their inheritance of the very best alleles from their parents. And that will be my elite male and female line. I'm then gonna take those cell cultures and I'm gonna genome edit them. I'm gonna knock in the gene I want to or knock out the gene I want to, or maybe knock in two genes I want to, whatever I wanna do. And then I'm gonna sequence it and make sure I got exactly what I wanted. It's homozygous, it's non-mosaic, it's got what I want. And then I'm gonna just take that Nucle uh, the diploid cell, clone it into an enucleated oocyte, put it into a surrogate dam, and here's our edited offspring nine months or so later. This step only adds a couple of months if everything goes well and I don't have any cloning artifacts associated with those animals. That's how you might incorporate it into a breeding program. And so what has it been used for so far in cattle breeding programs? Well, I'm gonna go through these different traits. And I think the point I wanna make is we haven't changed our breeding objectives. We would still like productive animals that are tolerant of heat, that have good uh, yield, good product quality, and that are disease resistance. What this does is adds another way to, to achieve those goals. And so these are some of the different examples. So you could do a myostatin gene knockout. So that was that big muscly animal. You could target that gene and try to knock it out and improve meat yield by 30%, but maybe not in such an exaggerated way as we see in the Belgian blue. Maybe you want to do it in a more nuanced way because you have exact control over which allele you're going to introduce. Maybe you want to introduce no horns into dairy cattle genetics. And I'll talk a little bit about that because my lab's been quite involved in that. That's a welfare trait. There's a couple of heat tolerant traits that we'll talk about here. Uh, maybe you want to knock out allergens. So people are allergic to milk because of beta lactoglobulin it's a protein. Well, let's get rid of that. So they're no longer allergic to milk. Uh, maybe we want to improve meat tenderness. Uh, maybe we want to increase the healthful fatty acids, the omega-3 fatty acids. Of course, big focus on disease resistance because we lose 20% of animal production to disease. And wouldn't it be good if we could have disease resistant animals? And then these two a little bit to do with altering breeding program design. And I'll give you one example as we go through the talk where it offers an opportunity to pot potentially enable us to have natural service sires delivering elite genetics that is effectively AI on legs. So what might we knock out? These are some published examples of genes that have been knocked out. Genes associated with disease susceptibility, allergens, unwanted development, and thermotolerance. So I'm going to put up 
I realize this is not a cow, um, but I think it's the kind of the flagship example when people talk about genome editing in livestock. It is a gene that was knocked out at the University of Missouri originally that results in pigs that are resistant to the porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome virus or PERS. Um, and I think we're all pretty familiar with respiratory viruses right at this particular juncture in history. Um, and actually this respiratory and uh, reproductive virus is a very big uh, problem in the pig industry in countries that are shaded in orange on this map and knocking out this gene that is left-hand pathway no longer expressing a protein removes the target site where that virus is able to invade the pig and so those pigs no longer present that virus that that protein to the virus so they're no longer susceptible and that means that they're resistant to PERS. Um, and that is the first product that's being taken through for approval through the FDA by um, the breeding company genus. So that's an example in pigs there. And I guess I realize I'm a geneticist, but it's for me, uh, a genetic solution to disease is better than having animals that are getting sick and getting treated uh, and, and losing out for the farmer and for the animal. Uh, it's a better approach than treating sick animals with chemicals. Here's gene editing uh, example. This is actually at Texas A&M, uh, an example in Nalore where animals have been targeted on the myostatin gene. And I probably don't need to point out the animal on the right there uh, is an animal that has had the myostatin gene edited. Uh, and this would be an approach, obviously, to increase muscle yield. But as I said, you can do it in a more targeted and nuanced way than just beating the entire gene out of existence. You can do a modification so that you have um, maybe an animal that has more yield but doesn't have the carving uh, problems that are associated with things like Belgian blue. Um, here's an example of uh, beta-lactoglobulin getting knocked out in milk from uh, cattle in New Zealand. So beta-lactoglobulin is one of the main proteins that people are allergic to in milk. Here's an example where there's an allele substitution uh, that changes the black color of Holsteins to this um, brown color with the idea that the brown will absorb heat less efficiently than black. So if you wear black in the heat, you know that that absorbs more heat. Um, and so this is a thermo adapted um, example. And then uh, recently, and this I'll talk a little bit more about this at the end as it relates to regulation, um, there has been uh, efforts to replicate this naturally occurring mutation known as SLIC that exists in certain breeds of cattle, for example, Senapol, where a targeted knockout of the prolactin receptor can result in this SLIC uh, characteristic, which is a very sleek hair coat. And those animals in general, their body temperature is about one degree lower than cattle that have a traditional hairy uh, coat. Um, and actually, there's a company, uh, Recombinetics, that has recently introduced that trait into two red Angus bulls to produce slick red Angus animals. And I'll talk more about the regulatory path of that uh, in a little bit. And this is the final knockout example I'll use. And this is where I'm going to stretch this reproductive audience mind a little bit in that how you might use genome editing, not to necessarily target a trait like slick, but to actually alter breeding program design in a way that is kind of uh, quite, quite intriguing. And so I'm going to use this example here, which is perhaps particularly well suited for this environment, which is a hot environment where maybe um, indicus influenced animals do better reproductive, uh, excuse me, from an environmental adaptability perspective. But maybe you'd like an indicus influenced animal to be delivering maybe straight Angus genetics to get um, an offspring that's an F1 that has an Angus sire with the Indicus influenced female adaptability traits. And that might be useful for an environment like Texas or uh, also in Northern Australia, where you have a lot of Indicus influence um, and you would like to have an F1 side by an Angus, but the Angus can't hack it in the hot environment. So what am I talking about here? So this is a thing called surrogate sires, and there's two pathways here. There's the host and the donor. And so what we would like is this donor is going to be a very excellent female and male producing thousands of hundreds of embryos. So this is similar to the way I started off the uh, previous discussion. And we're going to take the best male and female here and establish 
embryonic stem cells. And embryonic stem cells are cells that can contribute to any um, tissue in the body. They're kind of the very primordial aspect of embryonic development. And that has recently uh, been accomplished in the lab of Pablo Ross, uh, who was uh, previously at um, UC Davis. And we would potentially edit these embryonic stem cells. So now we have gene edited, in this case, superior male embryonic stem cells. Okay, we'll hold that thought. Excellent genetics on the left. On the right here, we have the host. And so in this case, we're talking about a male and a female coming together, and we're gonna genome those em embryos to knock out a gene associated with germline development. So either eggs or sperm, I'm gonna use the example of a bull, so let's say sperm. So now we have produced an infertile male and we're now gonna complement these in a thing called germline complementation, such that the genetics that is coming from this side is going to populate the gonad of this bull, such that after he has been born, uh, he is going to be an environmentally adapted, e.g. Brahmin bull, with the genetics of whatever was on the donor side. Maybe it's Angus, maybe it's, it's whatever you want it to be. And just imagine that you could do that and actually have the genetics populated by the best AI bull in the breed, um, except you don't have to AI because the bull is out there performing natural service, delivering that superior genetics to the commercial cow population. And it's really a way to reduce the genetic lag that exists between the genetics of the seed stock or the very best AI bulls and typical genetics of a, of a, a natural service bull. Um, and I think that's, you know, this can only come about because you can edit out that germline of the host such that you're able to then repopulate it with embryonic stem cells from the elite um, donor animal. So that's something to think about. Uh, and so I'm not sure what that does for your synchronization protocols, because now the bulls can do it all and you can go home and uh, have a rest. Uh, so kind of an intriguing idea. So what might we knock in? So that's the right-hand pathway where we're providing DNA template to knock in a gene or an allele. Well, really doesn't change our breeding objectives too much, whether we're doing knockouts or knock-ins, we're still doing much the same thing. So here's an example where genome editing was a knocked-in to produce bulls that are resistant to tuberculosis, a zoonotic disease with global implications and um, actually is spreading quite a lot through the UK at the moment, um, being spread actually by badgers. And there's a, just an intriguing debate between the badger-loving people in the UK and people that really don't like zoonotic diseases as to whose rights uh, get to prevail in this situation and so maybe if we had disease resistant cattle we could still have badges as well um, that would be one example and then i'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about these gene edited um, pole calves because it's a project that our lab's been involved with um, and this is basically an, a gene it's, it's quite complicated the genes called poles but there's a phenotype or a characteristic called poles which means you don't grow horns Okay, so if I'm polled, I don't grow horns. And the reason I don't grow horns is because I have an allele, a dominant allele at the polled gene that results in polled phenotype. So for example, many of the Celtic breeds of beef cattle have this allele. And if we compare this polled allele, this dominant polled allele to the original gene as it exists, for example, in dairy cattle genetics, there's been a small duplication of a 212 base pair segment in the polled allele. And so this sequence is duplicated down here and it replaces a 10 base pair sequence here. Amongst the 3 billion base pairs that make up the bovine genome, I just want to put that in context because that might look like quite a big change, but it's a tiny little change. We don't know why this causes poll. It's upstream of the, the coding region. It's, it's in the regulatory region. We don't know why but it does. And so this has been well known for many years by anybody that breeds any of the beef cattle. And so this is the dominant allele in all of the dairy cattle breeds. So most dairy cows grow horns and they have those horns physically removed through a cross process called disbudding, where basically as a calf, their heat is applied to burn off that horn bud. And that's an animal welfare concern for the general public. Um, the cows don't particularly enjoy it either. And here we have a genetic solution to that. So back in 20, well, 2015, a grant from the USDA was used to produce a genome edited line that basically introduced this allele 
from um, Angus or any of the Celtic breeds into this bull. And he is a homozygous um, polled uh, dairy cattle bull. And so I just want to point out the time frame here. This is 2016. This was before any regulatory decisions had been made regarding genome edited animals. And some of us were naive enough to think that maybe because we're actually just moving an allele from one breed to another, which is kind of crossbreeding, right, um, that it wouldn't be triggering any additional oversight or regulatory over oversight. However, in January the 19th of 2017, one day before the administration changed, um, there was a decision that came out of the FDA saying that they were going to regulate all genome alterations or altered genomic DNA, including base pair substitutions, SNPs, deletions, insertions as new animal drugs. Okay, well, what does that mean? Well, what that means is that if you want to introduce any food derived from an, an, an investigational new animal dr drug, you need to get prior FDA authorization and do so with an investigational new animal drug INAD process. And what is a new animal drug? Well, it's basically the process you have to go through to get approved to bring a drug to market same way that vaccines had to go through its approval process. And we have a little bit of experience with this in animal agriculture, and that is this guy. So this is the Aqua Advantage salmon. It's a genetically engineered, so traditional GMO with a transgene from Pacific salmon in Atlantic salmon that was produced, and I want you to look at the time here, in 1992. So 30 odd years ago, and this shows siblings, one inherited the transgene and one didn't. I'll let you figure out which one got the transgene. And these fish get to market weight in half the time of a conventional salmon. And they're raised indoor in, in net uh, circulating pens. And as you know, feeds about 70% of the cost of production. So if you can get a fish to market in half the time a normal fish takes, you're using less feed, you're gonna have less of an, of an environmental footprint, less out inputs to produce that amount of output, attractive from a fish fisherman's perspective or fish um, farm's perspective. But what this shows is the timeline it took for this product to go through the FDA's new animal drug approval process. And basically the founder event of that fish was produced in 1989, not long after I was back at Genetic Resources here in Texas. Um, and the founder fish was produced in Canada by a university, not a company. And then the company started, a company took um, ownership of it and started going through the INAD process in 1995. They submitted regulatory studies showing it, it grew faster, it was safe to eat, safe for the environment because it was going to be triploid and infertile and raised in, um, in, in tanks. Um, and basically all of the data was submitted by 2009. And then in 2010, there was a federal meeting at, in Washington where the FDA said this product is, is good to go. It's safe for the environment, safe to eat, and it grows faster. Then for no obvious reason, there was just a five-year delay in making any decision for the company. And you can imagine if you're a company, this is their one product, they can't sell it because it's an unapproved animal drug and they can't really do anything until they get an approval. This is a real problem if you want to try and get people investing in your company uh, or keeping it afloat whilst you're waiting for that decision. That decision was made in 2015. Immediately after that decision, there was a, a lawsuit that was brought um, by the, a, a group of uh, environmental um, activists, I guess, and the uh, senator, great senator from the state of Alaska. Well, I wonder why Alaska wouldn't want uh, fast-growing salmon to come into fruition anyway uh, that got thrown on there and basically there was a big long delay after this until finally um, it was able to be brought into uh, the United States and actually just last year it was actually available to eat um, and um, and we did we've actually had a, a, a that salmon at our house and so basically during that 30 year period the the company was showing that the 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 what the genotype of the fish was uh whether it was durable so they had to do a multi-generational study they had to do food safety studies they had to show whether it actually grew faster and all told they've spent over 20 million dollars in getting regulatory approval for a fast-growing fish 
Well, as a breeder, if you look at chickens or cattle or milk cattle, that's pretty much what we select for often is fast growth. Um, and we do all of that with no regulatory oversight. And to have a $20 million multi-year, effectively 30-year regulatory approval process is not very attractive if I introduce a single base pair change into the genome of a cow. Uh, because that happens all the time. That's the basis of our breeding programs. And just because it's intentional doesn't mean it's any more risky or hazardous than what happens during just natural selection. And so I kind of see editing as kind of a, a cherry on top of the breeding Sunday. And so it does not replace conventional selection. It doesn't replace breed associations. It doesn't remove the need for phenotyping and record keeping and all the rest of it. It still is going to require all that. What it does is effectively and allows you to put a cherry on top of the breeding Sunday. And that is you can introduce useful genetic traits without the linkage drag that is typically associated with crossbreeding. And um, that's really where it is. But whether we're going to be able to use it or not is going to very much depend on what our regulatory approach is. And I think that there's some concerning trends as it relates to the regulatory approach that's being taken by some of our neighboring countries. And so what I show here is for the, the um, bull that I was talking about, um, the homozygous genome edited bull, we worked with uh, Recombinetics or Asalogen to produce some offspring from that bull. So we mated this polled animal across some horned Herefords to produce six calves that were horned Hereford dams, genome edited Holstein polled bull. And Mendel knew what he was talking about, not surprisingly, and that is they never grew horns. And we kept phenotyping them for two years and they just kept not growing horns. And so here's some offspring of that bull. Um, this is a female in this case, this is a princess. And you can see she's not growing horns and her neighbor there who was sired by a conventional Holstein of course, the Cinderella, uh, she grew horns the whole two years. And so we were able to show that and we actually published that paper back in 2020. And we said to the FDA, can we put these animals in the food supply? Because we're done, we're done with the experiment and they're still not growing horns and there's nothing else going on here. And basically to get food use authorization, the FDA said, sure, you could put them in the food supply if you could just provide us with the following information. And what they wanted was a nutritional compositional analysis of the meat. Um, and they would also like um, all of the details on how we got that meat. They would also like, um, they didn't really say what they wanted us to analyze, but maybe fats, proteins, carbohydrates. So that's, that's proximate analysis, no big deal. Oh, also um, minor compounds such as minerals and vitamins. Okay, certainly all measurable, but it's getting more and more expensive. And what's the hypothesis here that not growing horns is going to affect meat? composition somehow like I don't know it's kind of a strange thing and any information that could help us with the food safety of these animals as it relates to them not growing horns but not any information from animals that are produced using conventional breeding that don't grow horns well there are no other genome edited animals so that really was not the information we had available and then in the case of the female we'd also like to look at her milk composition um, and I don't know if you guys know this but you only get milk after they've had a calf and so that's another nine months that you have to wait and so we were asked for all this information and we're like okay this is the first offspring of genome edited animal we will collect it as a university because I was able to get a grant to do it and to basically set the stage and provide evidence-based information as to do we really need all this information on every edited animal? Because if we do, the industry can say goodbye to the concept of genome editing in our cattle breeding programs. And so just this year, we published the final um, uh, paper where we looked at the growth and health and the meat and milk composition of these uh, heterozygous hornless offspring of this genome edited bull. And I'm sure this will be a great shock to this audience. They were healthy. They grew just like the controls um, and their meat did not differ. So this is the genome edited animals. This is the controls that basically didn't alter. It wasn't any different in any um, of the measurements that we took. And then, of course, we had to wait for Princess to have her calf, and that takes nine months. And so finally, she had her 
calf and not surprisingly his name was Prince. What else would a princess have? He was born in 2020. We collected milk samples. We analyzed the milk samples. And then of course you have to have controls. Well, what's an appropriate control? And that gets a little complicated when you're working with a half Hereford, half Holstein control. So we did have Cinderella. We had a couple of random horned Herefords that were running around. And basically we looked at the milk and Sometimes it was significantly different between animals. Sometimes it was genome edited animal. Sometimes it was a breed effect. Sometimes it was a stage of lactation effect. All of these known things that affect milk composition that we frankly don't normally care about because milk's milk. Um, and whether it's Jersey milk or Holstein milk or she's two days in milk or 20 days in milk, that all gets blended together and it's just milk. We don't normally look at any of this stuff. And so the bottom line was there was nothing significantly different to the types of variation you see in milk and meat of the food we eat. And so there were no unique safety health, health and safety concerns associated with these animals. We've done that study. I hope nobody else has to do that study because that's a waste of taxpayer money, quite frankly, because all of these animals that were involved in this experiment, including the original genome edited bull, the, the horned Herefords he was mated to, the offspring he had. So there's Princess, her five brothers, then some horned Hereford controls, and then the Holstein times horned Hereford controls that did grow horns. That was what we had to maintain and feed for this experiment in order to get the data. And this started back in 2014, the cell line was edited. The bulls were born in 2015, they moved to Davis. We bred them to our horned Herefords. The announcement came out, they were now drugs. And suddenly I had six drugs gestating in cows. I went from being a scientist to a drug dealer. Um, the cows were born in 2017. And then we sequenced it. We published the data. We asked for permission to put them in the food supply. And then we had to provide all the meat data. So here's meat getting collected um, from the founder bull. So bye-bye, Bury. Then there's meat collection from the five male offspring. Bye-bye, boys. Then the female was bred. We collected the milk. Meat from princess, oops, sorry, by princess. They all had to get incinerated because they're unapproved animal drugs. Everybody else went in the food supply with no problem. Um, and you can imagine that's not usually how we run our universities. We don't usually burn our animals. It's kind of the first time I've ever actually burnt taxpayer money, literally. Um, so, and then finally we published the paper. I don't think that's a very good approach and it's not the approach being taken by our major competitors. And I think that is a problem for US agriculture. So South America for the most part is saying, if you could have achieved that edit using conventional breeding, you're not gonna be treated any differently to conventional breeding. And they don't make a distinction between whether you're editing food crops or you're editing animals. So here you can see Argentina, here you can see Brazil. Even Australia is saying, if you're just doing a knockout, we're not going to treat you any differently. So I could go do surrogate sires in Australia, but here those animals would be considered to be um, new animal drugs and I have to go through a new animal drug approval. So that is kind of where we have been. Um, and so here's, for those of you that didn't catch that, United States down here, 10 for plants, because if you could have achieved it using conventional breeding, you're not treated differently in plants, but animals, we have this situation with the new animal drugs. That's where we have been. There wasn't a attempt during the last administration uh, by Sonny Perdue to basically get editing for animals for food purposes moved over to the USDA. And so they put in a notice of proposed rulemaking that was published in the Federal Register um, just, just prior to the current administration taking office. And just uh, is put the Federal Register is where you put these things, a notice of proposed rulemaking. There were 51,000 comments submitted, which is a really large number, and 50,000 of them were from the same activist groups that opposed GMOs. And then there was about a thousand sensible comments from people saying, this is this, we need this. We need to be able to use this technology. So at the moment, it's not clear where we stand, but there was an interesting decision this year that I'm going to go over because it affects those slick animals I mentioned earlier. Those slick animals were produced through introducing editing reagents into a developing zygote. So going down that pathway, not the cloning pathway, but the other pathway, which results in mosaic animals. And so basically in March of this year, um, the Acelogen approached the FDA and said, we would like to put these animals, their meat and their potential offspring, so semen and eggs, into commerce. Um, what, what do you think? And so basically the FDA looked at the animals, they were slick. They didn't have any insertion of foreign DNA and they didn't really have any other characteristics that were novel. And they made what's called a low risk 
determination. What that means is they said, we're going to give you enforcement discretion. And enforcement discretion is, I think, something we experience every day. So the speed on the freeway is 65. Who drives 68? Pretty much everybody. Because you know you're going to get enforcement discretion from the CHP. They could pull you over, but they're much more likely to go after that person going 90 because that's riskier and their time is better spent going after riskier things. That's enforcement discretion on behalf of the CHP. What the FDA is saying is it's a slick bull. This is not worth our time to pursue um, you guys for selling this into commerce because it's a low risk product. Therefore, we're giving you enforcement discretion. It was the same approach that was used for the transgenic um, glowfish, which are available um, as, as pets. And basically what this does is it gives them an opportunity to put those animals into commerce. And that was because the FDA determined that the, the alteration already exists. We know for example, Senapol have it. We've already eaten it. It's a low food risk. It's a low environmental risk. There's not a lot of bulls running around spreading their seed uh, uncontrolled. And therefore, they're not going to object to Exalogen marketing the intentional genomic alteration or the associated products. And by the associated products, they include not only um, products going into the food supply, but of interest to this uh, group also, Semen, embryos, and meat can go for the two bulls, just those two bulls, not a third bull, not a bull that someone else makes using the same edit. That would have to go through a separate uh, enforcement discretion. So it's a very limited, I don't want to use the word approval because it's not an approval, it's an enforcement discretion. But it is at least a way for a product to get to market. Um, and so I see it as a little bit of a crack in the in the regulatory. Um, and then additionally, the FDA says they don't intend to um, consider farms that buy the semen or embryos from these bulls to be drug manufacturing facilities, which I know that sounds ridiculous, but that's what UC Davis is at the moment. And so I get all sorts of interesting questions about um, what sort of effluent containment I have for my drug manufacturing facility. Pretty much they just poo in a pasture. Uh, that's how we do our, uh, our drug manufacturing. So that is important because it means that people can buy that without worry that the FDA will come and in, in, inspect their place. And it, <clears throat> importantly, these uh, were mosaic. And so it's important to label that they don't actually know what the germline of those animals is going to look like because it was edited uh, using the, the embryo approach. And until those bulls are basically matured, and they can do some semen sampling. We won't really know exactly what trait that'll pass along. Hopefully, for their sake, it'll be homozygous uh, knockout. And then all of the calves, because it's a dominant trait like horns, will also be slick. Um, and so that's just a little bit of a, a kind of a proviso. So how do I envision genome editing might be used in the future? It offers a, an approach to repair. Um, genetic defects, especially if they're small genetic defects, single base pair change. It offers an opportunity to introduce useful alleles into breed germplasm, such as poll into dairy cattle genetics. Primarily useful for Mendelian traits, that is single gene traits. It's, it's not gonna make an animal resistant to all diseases, but it might make them resistant to PERS, for example. It could potentially alter the divining characteristic of a breed. So I don't know, let's just think of Scottish long hair animals, what if you put slick into them? What, will, what would that look like? You could take their horns off. They wouldn't even be Scottish longhorns anymore. They'd be pole slick. I don't know what they'd be. Um, you could use it to introduce traits to skew the sex ratio of the offspring, produce more males, more females, or novel breeding designs, such as those uh, surrogate sires I mentioned. But the use by industry is very much going to hinge on that regulatory framework and what the FDA determines to do. Uh, at the moment, that dramat is diff dramatically by country. And to me, the future of genome editing is going to be governed by the development of a fit for purpose, regulatory based, uh, risk based regulatory framework that fosters innovation and allows useful products to come to market, enables trade because at the moment the EU considers all of this to be GMOs and promotes public acceptance, which will be another big one there. Um, so that's basically where we are with genome editing. And I just want to acknowledge uh, the sponsors of my lab. We can't do any of this research without uh, sponsorship. And um, I'm happy to stop there and take questions. Mm.
I will. Questions, questions for Dr. Van Nieman. It's not like, ah, there you go. That's it. So, what's going to prevent sort of back action coming back to the United States, being a member of the cetera? And so, are we going to see changes in importation based permits that you're going to have to declare whether the use and how many generations are you going to make those type of issues? So that's a really good question, and I think one that we haven't tackled yet, because basically the way that the South American countries are approaching this, if they're not being treated differently to conventional breeding, they're not going to be tracked necessarily differently to conventional breeding. It's a little bit similar to the cloned problem in the EU to some extent. Um, but I did ask the FDA that, and they said, well, the drug developer would approach us to get uh, um, a residue tolerance. And I like it. So, and I totally get that for ivermectin or, or drugs, but in the case of an absence of a SNP, I'm not sure what the residue tolerance would be for a deletion. Um, and I also don't know who the drug manufacturer is in this case, because it's just going to be some cattle breeder. Um, and so to me, it, that response indicated a total lack of kind of comprehension of how this, how this all goes down as it relates to breeding. It's very much a small molecule mindset of approving a drug, which is totally appropriate for drugs. I just don't think DNA variation is a drug, because uh, if it is, we're all super high in here because we're all genetically different to each other, right? And so it's just, it's not, I realized they made that determination because that's how the legislative language is written. Food, drug, and cosmetic acts. If it's not a drug, FDA can't regulate it. So guess what? If I'm a hammer, everything's going to be a nail. Um, and so it's going to be a drug. So that's kind of where we're at. Same thing. Is that going to have? If someone else wants to do that same thing, is are they going to have to go through the total regulatory process as well? Yep. So the, the question related to the Black Angus bull here in Texas that's red. Um, and so <laughs> that was actually um, an ultra, and I believe this is a cloned example. Uh, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm almost sure that would be true. Um, so there's basically two alleles that affect coat color. And so black is dominant to red um, in most cases. That's kind of the, the one you're most familiar with. But there's also a dominant red gene that exists in dairy cattle genetics. And my understanding is both of those in mutations were introduced to make a red black angus that will sire dominant red offspring from the dominant red that came in from the dairy cattle did i get that correct all right that's the background i didn't mention that animal partly because um it's it's not public might have been on a facebook page but it hasn't been publicly announced um and also i believe that the way that that um semen was sold was it would not be distributed until it had what I assume they're going for is enforcement discretion um, in the same way they did for the for the knockout animals. I haven't, and that would require providing DNA information. I haven't heard an outcome there, so that's what would happen. But to your question, if you now develop a red black Angus bull, that pro you would have to get separate enforcement discretion because you would have used a different product to, to make that happen. And it can only be obtained by companies. I've been told as an academic that enforcement discretion is never an option for us. Um, so I guess I'll just be burning cows the rest of my life. Um, so yeah, that's that's where it stands at the moment. One last question. No, let's thank you, Dr. Vinny, one more time. Thank you very much.